Sonic, the heart of your system. I'm Leo Water for Kick Guru. This is meant to be a Leo says opinion piece, but truth be told, it's actually a Leo asks because I've got all sorts of questions rattling around my brain. Um, and I don't really have much in the way of conclusions at the moment. So I'm going to throw out some questions and you good people are going to put comments below the videos and I'm going to look at them and I'm going to go, oh, right, that makes sense to me. Also, I'd like to clarify something. Uh, right now, I'm not in a grumpy mood. I'm feeling perfectly mellow. Uh, but sometimes people think I'm being grumpy. So let me just uh, give you a demonstration. This is me being grumpy. Okay, that's me grumpy. This is me thinking hard and trying to remember what the heck I want to say. You can see my point, yes? When I look grumpy, very often, I'm just thinking and trying to remember stuff. Uh, it gets harder as you get older. So, first question of the day is, what is overclocking? Generally speaking, overclocking, you get, I'm talking about CPUs here, it applies to GPUs obviously, but generally CPUs, you've got a CPU that runs at, let's call it 3 gigahertz to pick an arbitrary number on all cores, and you pump some more voltage into the thing, and you crank up the multiplier, and it does 3.5 gigahertz. Numbers are irrelevant, and that is overclocking, um, and we all understand that. Uh, but uh, this has been really muddied in the past few years by all the dynamic overclocking, the turbos and the boosts and the such like. So your CPU sits there more or less idling at say 2 gigahertz. When it wakes up, it's on the desktop at 3 gigahertz. And then it'll kick up to say 3.5 gigahertz all cores. And then a few lucky cores will go on to 3.7 gigahertz for argument's sake. Uh, this has been really thrown in our face by the second gen Ryzen 7s and 5s in recent times, XFR2 and so on, Precision Boost Overdrive, all sorts of good stuff. Uh, there's a silicon lottery aspect to it, but there's also a cooling and a power thing going on. And uh, the software inside the CPU looks after the CPU and it tells which cores they should boost how far and keeps an eye on what's going on. And there's obviously something similar going on with Intel. Although it does feel as though the AMD approach is actually more sophisticated. Uh, but then Intel's been busy with other stuff, haven't they? Recently, I took a look at uh, some Threadripper motherboards, X399, and this is a, a funny state of affairs because uh, Threadripper, Threadripper 2nd Gen, still X399, so we've seen some new X399 boards, and the new Threadrippers, uh, W and WX, uh, they uh, use the new algorithms that we saw in 2nd Gen Ryzen. Uh, and it was really apparent with second gen Ryzen that overclocking was just pretty much a waste of time. Turn the thing on, let the let the software sort it out, and you got the best of all worlds. You could manually overclock to a certain extent, but it didn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, I'm sure if you're very, very clever and dedicated, you could get better performance manually overclocking than the software can manage, but I, I, I don't think most of us can do that. Um, and then you've got the thing of some software... Uh, some applications will work better with all cores, other applications, and you want one or two fast cores. So the, the thing needs to be dynamic, and that's with the second gen of processor. Uh, when it comes to the third gen, I'm quite sure the software is going to leave us trailing in its dust. Uh, so what I found was that the uh, second gen Threadrippers, the uh, 32 core 2990WX, has uh, the TDP has gone up from 180 watts to 250 watts in the new uh, processors. And if you raise the power, the processor is essentially capped in the in the BIOS. Uh, the power limit set to 250 watts, which is the TDP. And if you raise the number, you get, uh, to say, to 350 watts or 450 watts. The performance just takes off. Uh, and the processor is dynamically responding to cooling and, uh, and power. Uh, and it works very well. So it'll idle happily, and then it'll shoot for the stars. And the power draw is just <laughs> colossal. So head to kickguru.net and you'll see uh, graphs and such like once I've written those pages. Uh, but in the meanwhile, look on YouTube and we've got videos with all sorts of information. All good stuff. Here's my question. Does it count as overclocking if you change the power limit of a processor? So if you raise the 250 watt TDP cap number, let's call it a number. Um, it's relatively arbitrary to a higher number in the BIOS and thereafter you get more performance and obviously power draw goes up, temperature goes up when it's working hard. Uh, is that overclocking? Because we've had something very similar going on, on the desktop for years. Now, uh, at the last coffee lake, wasn't it? Um, and maybe the launch before that, there was a certain amount of kerfuffle because certain motherboard manufacturers, no names, no pack drills, uh, they were quite clearly raising the base speed, uh, the you know, the, the 100 megahertz uh, frontside bus speed. 
uh, they were sort of tickling up to 102, 103 to get the extra couple of percent performance. And that was considered to be naughty because you'd say, no, don't do that. And it still did it anyway. That was naughty. That was uh, overclocking on the sly. Uh, but the dynamic overclocking, the yeah, just let me sort of turbo or boost to whatever speed the process is happy with, is it overclocking? Because if it is, we've been doing that, or rather motherboard manufacturers have been doing that for years. Uh, I struggle to see that with Threadripper there's any difference, except that the numbers are much larger. The increase in performance is just huge. I mean, I was getting um, Cinebench scores were going up from like 5,000 or 5,100 to like 5,500 or indeed 5,800 with the uh, MSI uh, Meg Creation, which is a truly marvellous motherboard. Uh, and then if you manually overclock, I was seeing sort of 6,000 or 6,100. Well, if I have to do basically nothing apart from punch in some numbers to get 5,800, I'll stop there. I mean, I'm I'm entirely happy pushing on to get the six thousand. It looks good on paper, but five thousand eight hundred with no effort versus five thousand out of the box. Yeah, th th that's a good result. That's a really good percentage. So I am in two minds. So that's that's the situation now. So taking my Threadripper uh, testing from recent times as my working example, is that overclocking changing the power limit? Uh, and the real reason I'm thinking about it doubly is that rather than just saying well, I've done that move on is that we know full well that uh, well I guess we're going to call it ninth gen Intel Core i9 9900K Core i7 9700K and the Core i5 along with the Z390 chipset they're coming uh, in the next few weeks and I'm wondering what we're going to do about uh, describing the speed of the processors. So you get an 8-core 16-thread uh, processor or an 8-core eight 8-thread eight processor. How do you define the speed? We've been around the houses with this a number of times with uh, AMD. Because when I saw a Super O board from Supermicro, a Coffee Lake board that was a Mini ITX, they had actually set the power cap in that to 95 watts, which is the TDP. And as a result, that board looked really poor until you raised the number and then the board performed, the CPU performed correctly. So to my mind, with Coffee Lake 8700K, 95 watt TDP is not the power cap or not as far as other board manufacturers are concerned. So we're going to have this question coming around again. So my question is, what is overclocking? How do we define when things are out of the box auto and when are they? Hmm, that's a bit over the top. Uh, and is overclocking good or bad? Uh, what's the limit? How do we define the clock speed of a processor? That's my question. Really simple. And I've been around this a lot of times in my head and I'm not sure of the answer. More AMD stuff. And this is a funny one. So AMD has its server chips, the Epic. I still don't like the name, but the processors are quite clearly good. I mean, that's just an absolute fact. They are the super duper thread rippers. And they've come up with a scheme to sell Epic in China. But uh, due to licensing rules and uh, x86 architecture and so on, there's all sorts of cross licensing, certainly with Intel, AMD, and I presume other companies. AMD could not simply say to another company, here are the rights to make processors because that, that breaks the rules. So they've come up with a clever scheme whereby they've created a licensing scheme with a company called Thatic, uh, which in turn created a company called HMC, which stands for, and I'm going to give this a go, Hei Guang Microelectronics Company Limited, and also Hai Gong, and I'm not going to try and say what that stands for and those two companies each own a slice of each other and such like and AMD keeps hold of a slice of the overall thing and they're able to produce copies of Epic uh, they appear to be exact copies of Epic called uh, Haigong Diana something along those lines I mean my apologies for my pronunciation uh, so there are copies of Epic being produced by the Chinese in China and as far as I'm aware, Diana produces chips, uh, TSMC in Nanjing, SMIC, which is a Chinese fab in Beijing, and SMIC in Shanghai, which obviously is also. And the thing is, as I understand it, SMIC or SMIC uh, is currently working to improve its 28 nanometer process and is looking to develop a 14 nanometer process, which rather suggests at the moment it can't produce EPIC, EPIC being produced on a 14 nanometer process. Uh, basically, the Chinese at the minute are two or three st uh, steps in the, in the evolutionary process behind TSMC and Samsung. 
so at the moment you have to wonder where the 40 nanometer chips are being made and sort of suspicion is that it's global founders but i don't know so that's another question where are they currently producing these copies of epic and we we know that uh, tsmc is mainly located in uh, in taiwan but it's got fabs in china also in the usa singapore and it's invested quite a lot of money recently in china and it's looking to produce uh, 16 nanometer chips apparently h2 2018 so now although it seems to be slightly delayed could be wrong about that so production within china would appear to be not at the cutting edge and would appear to be not at a level that would uh, produce these copies of epic so my question is as i say is these copies of epic that are you know being made in china or made by a chinese company where are they being made my guess is not in china However, I suspect that very soon they will be made in China. 40 nanometer is a known quantity. But fabrication process is not that easy. Uh, recent news is Global Foundries has just stopped any development of 7 nanometer, as in they've been working on it seemingly for a while and they've just given up. Uh, they apparently have some uh, 7 nanometer machinery and as to what they're going to do with that, whether they're going to repurpose it for um, older processes remains to be seen. It doesn't seem like they can return to manufacturer. Uh, now, back in 2014, Global Foundries bought its 40 nanometer process from Samsung. So Global Foundries has been producing it 40, is producing it 40 nanometer, but the process itself they did not develop. I have to actually wonder when Global Foundries actually last successfully developed a process that actually works correctly, and they did it themselves. Uh, but that's kind of just a passing curiosity. So the 40 nanometer that Glowflow is using at the moment uh, is not their own they couldn't just do it themselves now we know the chinese have many many ways of getting information and there are an awful lot of chinese in the tech industry so i i have little doubt the chinese can move to 14 nanometer relatively swiftly i don't see any reason why they shouldn't be able to um, i wonder what pressure they can bring on tsmc after all according to the mainland chinese taiwan is part of china uh it's obviously a hugely complicated political situation, but I, I could imagine a situation where TSMC could feel hugely pressured to uh, assist the mainland Chinese. Uh, but Global Foundry steps out the door and we're left with Samsung and TSMC as the world leading fabs. Um, and as we know, TSMC, I mean, they recently had problems, lost production for a couple of days. And that kind of makes you wonder, because if, if they lose uh, production or well, apple and uh, nvidia and all sorts of other people you know uh, are they potentially in trouble um thank goodness it's only two days but tsmc they are hugely significant samsung obviously also hugely significant obviously also producing for apple and also for themselves um we don't know what intel's up to at the moment we know they've had all sorts of 10 nanometer problems we also know that you know your 14 nanometer and your 7 nanometer and your 10 nanometer different numbers they might actually end up being similar things in different ways but we have to hope that Intel's going to you know, get back on the case. And we've been working at 10 nanometer now for blooming years. So I, I cannot believe that Intel's out of the fab game. I, I just Not at the leading edge. I, I can't believe it. I might be wrong, but I can't believe it. So at the moment, I, I perceive it as being Samsung, TSMC and Intel. But what are the Chinese doing? What are the Chinese doing? There's no way in my mind that the Chinese are producing a copy of Epic to, for sale within China to keep within the licensing rules and they're going to manufacture it overseas that's not what the Chinese do the Chinese lead in so many different industries and so many different technologies that the Chinese simply have to be looking to produce 7 nanometer chips because the next epics the ones that are 48 core and the 64 core are going to be 7 nanometer a very apparently as you know silicon out the labs and being sampled already uh, those chips will be on sale um, in but a few months time from AMD so I have to assume that the Chinese even if they're not intending to do seven nanometer you know uh, first half of 2019 they have to be looking to do seven nanometer at some point in the near future they just have to be it makes no sense otherwise and they have to be looking to do that within China uh, so my question here is where who's going to produce seven nanometer in China for the Chinese. For that matter, what are the Chinese currently doing with 14 nanometer in China, if at all? It might be the answer is they simply aren't. But if they're not, then they will be. And then the question is where and when. And we have more NVIDIA. Uh, this time it's to do with RTX 2080, 2080 Ti reviews. Now, there, were, there was some kerfuffle, as we know, where Carl Bennett had OCP broke a story a while back about GPP, uh, where basically NVIDIA was changing the world of graphics because 
they could broadly speaking. Uh, Kyle was uh, fed that or led to that story by someone within AMD and the story in turn turned out to be as far as I'm aware completely correct absolutely 100% on the money and uh, after some while I think Nvidia was responding to the bad press and sort of said hmm uh, all right we've changed our minds we're not doing this anymore and they've stepped away from GPP apparently but nonetheless quite clearly the world has changed and now it seems that Nvidia is uh, looking for more control over uh, reviews of the upcoming 2080-2080 Ti. This time it's not just to do with their own graphics cards, obviously they can send their graphics cards to whoever they choose under whatever terms they choose, it's the add-in board partners, so your EVGA is a Zeus. Uh, MSI, Gigabyte, uh, Palette, whoever. And the arrangement seems to be that if uh, a Zeus, for example, wants to send a graphics card to uh, that reviewer over there, they have to establish which individual reviewer is going to actually do the review, not just the name of the site or the publication, get contact details for the reviewer, uh, and then presumably pass it to NVIDIA. And then the reviewer has to install the graphics card in their test machine, uh, log into some secure portal, and then from there they can download the driver for the machine. So the driver is presumably locked to the, the combination of machine and graphics card, which means they can't just hang on to the driver in the future. And that would seem to be it. You have to wonder about sort of digital watermarks. I mean, it'd be amazing to me if NVIDIA's gone to that length, if they don't then have the thing pop up in the future, any figures that come up with saying, you know, the name of the reviewer, whose driver it was that produced those figures. Uh, That would seem to me to be a logical move. And there's a degree of conspiracy theory. Is that the right word? This is my thoughtful face, by the way. I'm, I'm not angry about this. I'm just thinking. Uh, but I'll go with I'll go with conspiracy theory. That's not exactly what I mean. Uh, but you know, essentially, what are the implications? What does it mean? And broadly speaking, this is pretty much how it goes with reviews, albeit to the next level. It's long been the case. Uh, you, re- you can receive a graphics card for a review and you have the graphics card for two or three days before you actually get the drivers that make the thing work. And then once you've done some testing, you then get revised drivers two or three days later that will then work in whichever particular game it is or work better or whatever. This has long been the way. So this might be perceived to be a quality control thing. This might be NVIDIA's making absolutely blooming sure the drivers are absolutely spot on for that particular hardware. Could be that. Could just be they're making blemish or no one leaks anything, in which case, okay. Uh, NVIDIA has a history of being borderline paranoid about leaks. Uh, they, they keep an awful lot of information close to their chest. They tell you nothing, much like Apple. And essentially, it's a mark of this. Well, it's either what has made them so successful or they can do it because they are so successful. It's one or both. Uh, but NVIDIA is making the weather. It, it just is. Uh, NVIDIA is ruling the waves in terms of graphics, it's certainly at the high end, no two ways about it. If you want high end graphics, you're going to NVIDIA. Uh, at a certain level, I actually think that the reviews of RTX 2080 2080 Ti are pretty much irrelevant, unless the reviews discover something truly either awful, like it's a piece of junk, or truly remarkable. Basically, I think sales are going to be what they are because there's so much pent up demand out there. I think people are going to buy the hardware because they've been waiting for a new graphics card for so blooming long. They'll buy one rather than two, you know, one per PC, because I think uh, SLI performance is like, it's a thing of the past to to my mind. Uh, So people are going to buy these graphics cards because that's what they want to do. And unless reviewers discover something truly significant, I don't think the reviews are going to have a massive amount of difference, make a massive amount of difference. So uh, NVIDIA has changed how they're doing things. Uh, It's impacting Adam board partners I'm not able to get hot hot under the collar about this. I'm just not. Something that does truly get me going, really happy here, is that at IFA in Berlin, Samsung has shown off its Q900R consumer televisions, 8K televisions, in 65, 75, 82 and 85 inches. I love the idea of TV is still rated in inches and whatever that is in metric. Uh, so big, big, even bigger and really big TVs. Uh, I don't have no idea about pricing. I'm assuming horribly expensive. And they are 4,000 nit peak brightness and they'll do 8K AI upscaling. So they'll take some lesser signal and upscale it in some way, shape or form. They did make a note on there, forget about connecting them to your PC and gaming on them. Apparently that's not going to happen. I don't know why it won't happen. I mean, the idea of 8K gaming is just... Whoa. I mean, blimey. Um, although what sort of hardware you need? 4K is tough enough. But... 
The significant thing here about the Q900R is that the next uh, winter and then summer Olympics are going to be broadcast in 8K. I have no idea how they're going to be broadcast in 8K. How do you deliver that sort of signal? You know, forget a copper over the final mile. I mean, I'm not even sure about cable to your door. I mean, I think you pretty much need Ethernet coming up along the conduit and straight in the back of your TV. That's uh, how you deliver that signal. I really want to know where they're going to have 8K TV. I mean, Japan and uh, Korea, I'm quite sure about that. But uh, where else in the world are we going to get, you know, this is the Olympics. This is live TV. I mean, obviously, there's also recorded, you know, and all the rest of it. But uh, how the hell do you deliver 8K live TV? Then Another question. How do you deliver live 8K TV? That I truly want to see. Uh, just really pushing beyond 4K to the higher levels. Oh yes, that, that truly interests me. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you don't, give it a thumbs down. If you want more from Kit Guru, click to subscribe. Hit the bell button to tell you about new videos as they become available. If you've got any information about any of the points I've raised in this, any questions, please do comment below. I'm Neil Water for Kit Guru, and this was Leo Asks.